which for a lot of you gives you an opportunity to see how social justice work and activism can be manifested in the intellectual and scholarly work that you do in the academy. That is, you know, Richard Black has always said they are not necessarily separate, they're really just two sides of the same problem. And that's how we want to, to treat this evening. These, these crucial conversations that we do are exactly that. They are conversations that are sometimes intense, they are always respectful, and on the other hand, they are always incisive and gives you an opportunity to stretch a little bit, but also to help the presenter get to some different points in their work. And that's the purpose of this. It's not that anybody in the room knows everything and all things, but it does give us a, an opportunity to be critically engaged with each other. So uh, with that, without further ado, I'm going to go get some more chairs, and I'm going to bring that up, and she can tell you how they eat. Thank you. Please help. Uh, Linda Heritage, and I'm proud of presenting here. And I really appreciate you coming tonight and helping me think through um, a project that I've been working on for 13 years. If I'd known 13 years ago, I still wouldn't quite have finished the book by this time. I might have done something else, but life doesn't work that way, and it's been a good journey. Um, it's a project on Southern insanity, which is somebody who grew up in Alabama in the 1950s. Uh, and has lived through various permutations of the South and the nation. Southern insanity is seems to be a redundancy. <laughs> um, Southern, Southern insanity seems sometimes hard to find, especially if you come from Alabama, um, which is what's been going on these days. But I actually got into this project um, through my love of literature. I was trained in um, English at Duke, and I love Southern writers like Carson Colors, and I grew up an hour from her. And I read a, a book called Women's the Wedding, which had this little uh, gender-bending 13-year-old Frankie Adams, and she wanted to do interesting and uh, what might have been perceived as deep in bed. She was wearing DVDs and stealing the bed's pistol and throwing the knife at the wall. And um, at one point, um, Bernice, who was her uh, maid and really mother, and tended to her for probably way too good wages, told her, you better be careful. Um, the police going to come around here and, and tie you up and drag you off to Milledgeville. And Milledgeville was a name that struck terror in the people's hearts, just like Bryce's and Alabama struck terror for me, and Jackson might strike terror in Mississippi and various, in various names, and they were the names of where the state general hospital was, because you didn't want to be dragged off to Milledgeville. I didn't know what it meant when you said Bryce's, but I knew it was bad. So, got interested in it, I Googled it, uh, and I found out that when the was writing in the 1930s, the Venezuela State Hospital was the largest state hospital in the world. Um, we would go in and out of that distinction with other uh, hospitals. It had the largest graveyard of disabled people in the world. 25,000 graves with only federal markers with numbers on them, um, stretched into the woods as far as the eye can see. In fact, I soon went on the internet into the description of one of the hospital staff of that. He said rows and rows of numbered small rusted markers as far as you can see. It must be the most gruesome site in Georgia. Unknown human shunned with living, deprived of their very names and death, and literally known only to God. They were the unwanted society of the throwaways. Nobody cared to make markers. We knew that it could have been us. It was devastating. So, this is really compelling to me, and pretty soon after that, I ended up in the museum <coughs> in what had been the Millersville State Hospital, Central State, which was closing down but still open, because I had seen described the uh, lobotomy tools, which look like ice picks, um, the lobotomy group, the eye socket, it's an outpatient procedure, or the electric shock machines, or this, um, this cemetery that had taken 2,000 of these race so a particular uh, arrangement, and then built this beautiful angel who was kind of reaching the heaven and to the earth as a memorial for all the people who had come through there. I found a, uh, an article from Ebony in 1949 that, and that said that for white people, Central State Hospital in the late 40s and early 50s was like a prison, but for black people, it was like the lower level of Dante's Inferno or Auschwitz. Um, 
There was an expose by this guy who had been a um, conscientious objector in World War I called The Shame of the State. They went into every most of the state hospitals around and showed just the terrible conditions that were happening in these hospitals. So I got really fascinated with its history. I thought maybe I'd do literary criticism. The more I was drawn back to its archives, the more I decided I wanted to do a book. There's not uh, a book on the institution except for one that was self-published by one of the doctors who was one out of there in 1952 because of your kind man and he didn't last very long on the scale of the work. Um, and there's also not that many books about Southern asylums, although I think they're very formative. In their own way, it's formative as prison law, although they're not processing as many people because of the terror they can strike into your Part and because if you could be threatened as a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, you better be careful they'll send you to Millersville or Jackson or whatever, then it was a kind of policing that way. It was more than about mental health and symptoms. And so I wouldn't be able to capture all of that. And the more that I thought about it, I thought, well, I'll do the 40s, and I thought, well, I'll do 1912, and I thought, no, I want to go all the way back to 1842 and see what it means that a state hospital State mental hospitals, insane asylum for epileptics, idiots, lunatics, epileptics, and idiots. Um, what does it mean when one of those institutions is founded in the slave culture, as intensely <coughs> drenched in slavery as Georgia was? I read Orlando Patterson's Slavery and Social Death, and he said the United States had the most intense slave culture since the Roman Empire, and the two most um, pernicious states were Virginia and Georgia. So I figured, wow, if here's an insane asylum in a state that has the most intense slave culture since the Roman Empire, that's going to be pretty extreme. And so I ought to be able to trace what happened around slavery, what happened about the ex expulsion of indigenous people, the trail of tears comes through, um, is, is the a decade before the asylum is founded. Like, what happens with that kind of palpable and intense racism, white supremacy, settler colonialism? What can you see from Georgia? What can you see from Milledgeville about race and psychiatry that you might not see from, say, McLean Hospital up in Massachusetts, which was for rich people and was very well funded, and most of psychiatric history starts, starts in the Northeast and kind of trickles down to the South. So if we kind of turn the fight on the South, out from those what would you see? So that's basically what this book is about. Now, <clears throat> in terms of why psychiatric history and the study of one of these asylums is relevant, there, uh, you've got some pages here. And this is like contemporary crisis of the profession of psychiatry. We don't maybe have enough, so you can go on and I'll also, also summarize. It's a diagnostic crisis, a crisis of treatment, a crisis of ethics, and a crisis of leadership. Now, as I go through this, you might realize how much we're thinking about mental health and mental illness these days. Um, the shooting in that little church in Texas, what, why would that guy do that? Or, or um, one of the main concerns for the Koreans when they have this back channel uh, to America to think about nuclear weapons is like, is Donald Trump crazy? <laughs> I mean, they really want to know. So they, he's, well, he's, you know, so the psychiatric crisis has become even greater, I think, since we're working on this. But the diagnostic crisis. Now, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, how many of you know what that is? DSM. If you're studying psychology, you know that. It's, it's the kind of encyclopedia of, of diagnoses of mental diseases. And today, in order to get um, a prescription, for instance, you have to have a diagnosis, and the diagnosis will come from the DSM. It's very big, like a, a big phone book or something. The DSM-5 has been criticized broadly across the profession, including the whole book was written by, by the guy who um, edited DSM-4. Now, what does this open letter that these humanistic psychologists and psychiatrists sent to the DSM-5 say? This is the summary of it. And I think this is pretty intense. As we detail below, we are concerned in this book about, number one, the lowering of diagnostic thresholds for multiple disorder categories. What does it mean to lower the threshold of a diagnosis? If you have a high threshold versus a low threshold, can you get in or not? Low threshold, don't let more people in. High threshold, that's a little bit, right? So if you're lowering the threshold of the disease, you'll be able to diagnose a lot more people with it. 
Just think ADHD, second graders, and so forth. More people are going to probably get it. <coughs> um, this can result in false epidemics. About the introduction of disorders that may lead to inappropriate medical treatment of vulnerable populations. You can think race, gender, sexuality, and so forth, right? <coughs> Um, in addition, we question the proposed changes to the definitions of mental disorder that we emphasize sociocultural variation. What's sociocultural variation? What do you mean there? Sociocultural. So I'm going to take a shot. I think you can guess it just from the socio and the cultural. <laughs> It's constructed, it's social, it's embedded there, as opposed to biological theory. So there's a distinction between how why would biology be different than sociocultural variation if you're if you're thinking about causation. Okay. Um, biology is like it's more in the and mm -hmm. part of humanist versus social cultural, it's where it's more about people around you coming into it. Yeah, so if it's if something about me or you is seen as biological, it's not going to be very changeable. And it's not going to be predicted over generations, where if it's sociocultural, it's more fluid and changing and so forth. So they don't like that the sociocultural variation is being replaced by biological, biological theory. And this is dangerous, as we will see, over psychological history, because these biological theories get attached to people. Sociocultural variation is history. It's context, it's power, it's all it's race, class, gender, it's all of those things. And these people were saying it's not enough sociocultural variation, it's too much biology. In the light of growing empirical evidence that neurobiology does not fully account for the emergence of mental distress, as well as new longitudinal studies revealing long-term hazards of standard neurobiological treatment, Therefore, we believe that these changes pose substantial risk to patients, clients, practitioners, and the mental health profession in general. Now, whoa, you know, so all of this neurobiological treatment and research from the decade or so, or all these decades of brain research after the CAT scan brain, new versions of science in the brain and medicine, this is saying, like, they don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily well, they have long-term hazards, and they don't explain anything. And so we really need to be careful. There's a lot of it more harm than good. And this is like psychologists and psychiatrists from the profession doing this. So basically, by the end of this, they say, you know something? We need to think these categories from the ground up. We are going so far backward with DSM-5 in all the worst directions. And I'm not so sure they won't anyway, so we need to rethink mental health and mental illness and human behavior from the ground up. That's a pretty big claim. Then the crisis of treatment, the sheriffs put out a report with a, um, a mental health advocacy group in uh, 2014 that pointed out that nine out of 10 psychiatric beds today are in jails or prisons. One out of 10 are in like a state or private institution. Now, 60 years ago, in the 50s and 60s, there were half a million psychiatric beds in state hospitals across the country, many of them the shame of the states. Now, what would happen? Then you deinstitutionalize. People were sent supposedly to home to community care and didn't materialize. But what would account for now nine out of ten of these beds being in jails and prisons? What happened in the intervening years? What about jails and prisons? Did the number of people in jails and prisons go down or go up? Uh, up, right. Prison industrial complex, new Jim Crow, 300,000 to 2.3 million prisoners. So all of that got reinstituted within the prison system. That's pretty shocking, really. And the sheriffs themselves are pretty astounded and shocked by this. I mean, how in the world did this happen? Well, if they had been paying attention to the racialization of crime, they might know. But by this time, they're saying, you know, we are not, we are not trained to be mental health professionals. We're changing the sheriffs. And, you know, guards and all that kind of stuff. So that's a crisis, crisis in treatment, crisis in ethics. The American Psychological Association's leadership were forced by dissidents within the profession. And I would really, these other people too who are criticizing these diagnoses are dissidents within the profession. 
the dissidents with the American Psychological Association profession figured out that there were some psychologists who were helping the Bush administration in torture after 9-11. And they didn't feel like a psychologist who should be about healing should also be about torture. Now, the American Psychological Association denied it. Its leadership denied it. Um, and so they had a special uh, committee to investigate it. And it showed that actually they had been complicit in torture. And they really made the uh, Psychological Association back up. They made all the leadership quit. And these two guys who had done it, uh, Jenner, Jensen, and Mitchell, they make $81 million consulting on black condition sites, torture sites, um, in the decade after 9-11. So that's a crisis in ethics. And then there's crisis in leadership. Um, two titles, as I had mentioned before this issue. And Alan Francis, who did the DSM-4, his latest book is Twilight of American Sanity, a Psychiatrist Analyzes the Age of Trump. Calling Trump crazy, he says, allows us to avoid confronting the craziness in our society. If we want to get saying in this first game insight about ourselves, and we put Trump isn't crazy, but our society is. Or then the second book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess a president um, from the Yale Duty to Warn conference, where this group of psychologists and psychiatrists have said that they have a duty to warn if one of their clients is doing something that puts themselves or other people in danger, and even though uh, Trump is not their client, maybe we wish some of us might wish he, he was, they felt like this duty to warn had hit such a level that they had to kind of put out a warning about that. So whatever you think about Trump and whatever you think about psychiatry, the fact that these psychiatric questions are being asked so kind of globally now about an American president and in the way that have, really haven't been before, I uh, think indicates a kind of continuing uh, volatility of these questions in psychiatry. So what might a book that I'd want to write contribute to this? This other page, I don't know if they have it, some of you is what I intend to want to do with this book. Now, for those of you who uh, are going to write some books yourself or might be in the process of it, if you want to get money for it or if you want your advisor to um, approve your plan or whatever, you're going to have to write your intent. I'm at the National Humanities Council now. I had to write four pages on what I wanted to do to get out there. 600 something people applied, 32 of us got it, so so this is my intent that got me out there. But then you have to do it. But, but anyway, you know, the book is going to be called Administration of Lunacy, Race, Psychiatry, and Georgia State Hospital. So what am I saying I'm going to do? And that's what y'all can help me with. Number one, the book seeks to answer the question, how does a culture that justified slavery and refused to prosecute the lynching that fun function as a photographed public ritual decide who is and isn't saying? And what national forces hold such process in I mean, it's kind of an obvious question, maybe, but it's really not. And it happens at the county level because the same County officials who have a lunacy commission who are shipping people off to Millersville are also refusing to prosecute um, people who have openly lynched uh, African Americans and had their picture taken with the corpses. It's not like it's a mystery who did this. Why? So, what really does it mean about sanity itself and insanity in these state processes when that can happen? We want the book to lay open for its readers a dramatic and thick study of one iconic institution that's also an historic investigation into the degree to which U.S. psychiatry was a handmaiden to settler colonialism. Now, settler colonialism, colonialism is like Europeans or somebody comes and they take over territory and they just extract everything from it. Extract people as labor from Africa, extract silver, extract whatever, you know, extract timber, um, extract human spirits just extends away. Settler colonialism is when the people who came from Europe stayed. The American Revolution uh, was about settler colonialism. Um, it wasn't going to be just as in India having a colonial elite and then um, written rules through that. You, Australia, settler colonialism, South Africa, settler colonialism, Canada, United States. So it's a settler colony that starts on the west, on the east coast and goes all the way through in Georgia right there. So um, how does psychiatry work with settler colonialism? And that's what I really started to see when I was looking at all these archives. <clears throat> the takeover of white 
of indigenous people in Mexican, indigenous and Mexican land and African slave labor is a paradigm we haven't yet broken. So its effects resonate into our current moment. We can talk about the new Jim Crow, the third reconstruction in Reverend Harper's book. This paradigm about slavery and the attempt to eliminate it, we're still living that out. We haven't gotten out of it. And you can feel that in the psychiatry. <coughs> and I want to show you how. The book sets out to provide chapters that map the South's revolutions and counter-revolutions onto a succession of medical paradigms. It shows how, in Dorothy Roberts' terms, the function race serves as a political classification system remains the same, but scientists have discovered new ways of identifying, justifying, and proving race as a biological category. You remember how <coughs> the people criticizing DSM-5 said it was taking out sociocultural variation, it was uplifting biological categories, but these biological categories like race purports to be a biological category, right? But it's really a construct, a fiction, if you're studying um, social sciences, you know about social construction of gender and race and class. You know, to say that something is a kind of essential, same all the time, biological category is really a lie. You know? So, um, and Roberts is saying that every time <coughs> um, a theory of science or the body is slipping out of that, in, in the United States, there's, there's these processes that re-script these categories into race. And so I'm, I'm tracking and show it in a very tactile way how that happens. It's dialectical. Um, there's always people fighting for the right, and there's always spirit somewhere else where there's contraction in some places like the institutions. Um, one of the things that helped me the most in all the long work with these psychiatric archives, which as you can imagine, sometimes are fairly depressing. Um, <clears throat> the best things are not happening to these people. It was a sentence by Howard Thurman, a brilliant black theologian who was a friend of Martin Luther King Sr. from a beautiful book called The Luminous Darkness on the effect of segregation, the psychological effect of segregation on both black people and white people. But I read this sentence at 2 in the morning in Atlanta after I had been with a couple of months on these um, psychiatric lectures. And the sentence was, how does a human spirit accommodate itself to desolation? In other words, the human spirit is going to be in there working, whatever situation you're in. So I shouldn't assume that there wasn't happening with these people. And I really wanted to be um, in allegiance with the patients that I was getting information about. And a lot of the book is my attempt just to walk with them and try to understand the world as they saw it and the things that were intended to happen. I want to illuminate also how U.S. psychiatry always elevated white minds, realities, and emotional states at the expense of non-European peoples whose psychic natures and lives were consistently physically attacked in the culture and denigrated in psychiatric discourse. So repeatedly, the way that, and I'm looking right now a lot at the 19th century, but the way that the psychiatry points a light, um, it will always be, white people will be in the best light. And even though the terms might change, like in, before the Civil War, um, much of the theory thought that um, civilization went along with more insanity. You might think, okay, civilization means people were more sane, they're more sane, they're more civilized. But this theory in the early part of the 19th century was that industrialization and urbanization was creating so much change that made people crazy. But it made white people crazy. It didn't make native people crazy. It didn't make African people crazy because the cultures were too primitive and they were just happy and slaving in such a wonderful institution. These people really laid this out very explicitly in the psychiatric journals. But then once you get past emancipation, when you get toward the end of the 19th century, um, white, whiteness, especially middle class whiteness, becomes normalized. <laughs> and it becomes the problem Negro. And the problem with the Negro, as is discussed in the psychiatric literature, there's this whole section that my superintendent, this guy Powell, does in 1896 with a, a southern superintendent of the same asylums. And he asked the question, was emancipation prejudicial to the Negro? Now, the way you ask the question is the way you get the answer, right? I mean, you could say, was lynching prejudicial? Was slavery prejudicial? Is sharecropping, sharecropping prejudicial? But the, but the way they were casting this, is emancipation prejudicial? The answer was yes. Slavery was a great thing, and if anything that happens now, the issue is emancipation. So that's really flipping the script, and it's a direction 
again, away from white people um, whose behaviors were quite brutal and pathological, but that's not being looked at. So I want to, I'm looking at these, in these archives at what happens and how that happens. Um, the book is determined that its narrative doesn't fear its subjects, owns their beauty in the midst of tragedy, and <coughs> ensures that no theory overrides their self-understanding. And it figures that everybody feels crazy at some point and fears being crazy quite often. So anyway, that's the overviews of what I'm wanting to do. And <coughs> this is a little chart on I'm not going to go through this all now, um, but it shows different movements of <coughs> theories of medicine, theories of psychiatry, and then what's happening in uh, periods of southern and U.S. history. Most psychiatric histories don't do the last part. They just look at theories of psychiatry and theories of medicine. But what I'm wanting to do is fold back the other part of it and say, how did the removal of Cherokees, how did the theft of Cherokee land, how did the establishment of slavery, how did all of those processes that came from cultures that required huge amounts of violence, how did they impact issues of sanity, insanity, mental health, and treatment? And if you had a very close examination of one hospital to see what's happening there, what would be illuminated by that if you opened up the bottom piece of this? So, like I say, I'm not going to walk us through this right now, but that's what I'm trying to do, is to open up the bottom piece. Now, I want to read you some pieces of it, but let me just stop right now, though, because I've said a lot, and there's been a lot in these pages, to see if you have any questions, if you need clarification, or have me restate anything, or want to respond. Um, anything, I said. Can you go back to the statistic about prisons again? Is that how current of figures where you say 90%? 2014 is the report. 2014, that's Georgia. No, that's nationally. That's nationally. Nationally. Nine, this is the National Sheriff's Association. Nine out of ten psychiatric beds in the United States are in prison. Is there is there any benefit to declaring a prisoner uh, mentally ill? For the, for the right, system, I mean. right. In this, in this situation, where all the beds are in prisons, then you <coughs> might could get some treatment in a prison that you couldn't get outside of it. Right. But the sheriffs are saying, but we are not equipped to do that. I talked for a while to the sheriff in Baldwin County, which is where the Roseville State Hospital is, and he said that. Um, you know, he's a big advocate for prison reform because he says it's way too law enforcement is having to deal with way too much in terms of mental illness. He feels like the, the deputies in Baldwin County do it better because they have a 170 year history of dealing with psychiatric patients. And so many people in their families that worked in, in Central State Hospital and a lot of people get out of the hospital and stay in Milledgeville. <laughs> So there's a different kind of culture he felt like there, and he's become an advocate for the mentally ill and for prison reform, actually in Georgia and nationally too. So um, maybe there is, but we wouldn't want to have to look at it that way. You know, like what happened was the institutionalization sent people into supposed community care, where with with John Kennedy, there's supposed to be 1,500 mental health centers across the country. That never happened, Richard. Nixon started cutting, and then Reagan's austerity came along, and all the social funds got cut for the military and for the police that was growing. So you, you went from institutionalization to deinstitutionalization, taking people out of the institution, to transinstitutionalization, which is having people shuttle from the homeless shelter to the jail, to under the bridge, to the family's house, and so forth. Well, I guess part of what I'm asking is, so, so are you saying or implying that there's a criminalization yeah. of the of the, yeah. of the, of the condition? Yeah. yeah. Vandalism, people get picked up for vandalism or if you're hanging out in the drugstore, but somebody else is a customer and you're not, and it's your income, or, or you go off your meds, and you know, I think that there's that element in a lot of police shootings. Um, and, and so it's really mixed all and everything. But it used to be that everything was in these state hospitals. The central one in Georgia, other places had broken them up. And now it's so decentralized. And people were supposed to get, to get in care, the care's not there. 
that we can see what's happening with the insurance system under, under you know, the tax on the Affordable Care Act, even as we read. Um, so we know that kind of tumult from processes of neoliberalism, taking out social resources from the society, because you don't want to pay taxes, and then putting it in the police and the military. I apologize if you talked about this yeah. before I came in, but the U.S. has never managed or responded well to mental health. And I wonder if there are countries that do that we like to do. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that the European countries, especially the Northern European countries, that have substantial social welfare systems and haven't backed off of those or destroyed them so much as we have, do. I mean, there's ways to do it. Um, the state hospitals weren't funded. Um, pretty much the asylum failed by 1900 because it got too big. These institutes, just like psychiatry starts in the, in the state mental hospital, uh, and the superintendents are the first psychiatrists. And it's supposed to be a helpful environment, a structured environment for people to get away from home and whatever is kicking them off, and also to have their rational minds restored by structure and good attention from the doctor. And none of that is a bad idea. You know. But they kept sending states and counties kept sending more and more counties kept sending more and more people that they couldn't deal with, that they didn't want to deal with. People, old people who were senile, alcoholics, um, epileptics, um, and various so-called idiots, which kind of could be disabled people or um, various forms of mental illness. So, the institutions were increasingly loaded down and didn't have the staff in the state what they were going to pay for it. So you pretty soon, around the 1900s, get a situation where it's, made, it's not curative anymore. That curative didn't work because it was more crowded, and yet there's no other solution. So there's another 50 years that people were still sent to those institutions with increasingly kind of custodial and often punitive care with the orderlies being the least paid and the least educated and often quite brutal. In Georgia, by the 1940s, the patient ratio, like they rebuilt the New Deal, like they rebuilt a lot of the hospitals, and so they finally had a good ratio. And then World War II came along, and the doctors and nurses went off to World War II, and um, the doctor-patient ratio was one to six hundred or one to a thousand. And nurses were doing surgery, with the doctors giving them instructions over the telephone, and electroshock came around in 1942. The first 1800 cases of electric shock was quite women by 1840, 1948. I'm getting my centuries confused in this project, but 1948, 18,000 cases of electric shock. By the 1950s, Nevada means, which is the most, uh, um, the, it's the, the, the one mental health practice that's been most repudiated. The guy who invented it got a Nobel Prize. And then by 1959, people figured out it does not go anything in the body. So those, that was the condition in which either they stop these hospitals, you pay a lot of money for it, or you let people out. And Thorazine, the drug company, Klein Smith, had invented Thorazine at that point, which they made huge claims for in terms of its miracle effect. And they also bought huge amounts of advertisement in the medical journals. So the medical journals really liked Thorazine. It was the first of the big pharma stuff. And so today, even with nine out of 10 beds in jails or prisons, big pharma is making massive profits, at least at the turn of the 20th century, 20th, 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 20th century. It wants, you know. So the shift from the state that it completely botched the job and just left people there. The corporations, and no community care and austerity or neoliberalism then is that shift in the last years. And it's been as disastrous in many ways as the first one. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the archival records that you're using, yeah. particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, yeah. what George's yeah. prophecy has yeah. access to those? Right. Uh, I've got some stuff on the read from this, too, to show you how I'm working with it. But <coughs> the psychiatric records for 75 years are confidential. And when I got to the Georgia archives in Morrow, right outside of Atlanta, um, I looked around and one of the things I found were ledgers from 
1842 to 1924. So that's been kind of a baseline for me. They can be little bitty descriptions where you came from, how old you are, if you're married or not, um, if you're male or female, what your original uh, symptoms were, um, what might have been the cause. And the causes those days could be fell off course, um, lost your wife, had a disease, various menstrual difficulties of women, how they knew, how much bleeding or little bleeding you do. I haven't found out and I don't want to know. Um, various diseases, um, religious excitement. Um, by the early, early 20th century, drinking too much Coca-Cola, that was my favorite one, or eating a peach kernel. So there's a little eccentric set of things in that in there. Um, and some of them are like little um, short stories. I mean, the person who's writing it down got a lot of case history and they're really interested in it. Interesting. So those are the ones who work with the most. But you can also get a sense of how many people there and why. So those stories there. From 1909 to 1924, there's a set of case histories um, that are typed uh, in verbatim. Mostly the intake interviews uh, at the time, there's new diagnostic categories. What we would recognize is the categories that are getting criticized um, in the first letter, open letter to the DSM. Um, for being wrong in all these ways. But you can see them getting institutionalized. Uh, they come over from Munich. They float over transatlantically, and they end up in this little town in Georgia with these doctors who are not very well trained and not the smartest ones anyway. And the main thing they want to know is, do you manic depression or are you schizophrenic? And half the time, they don't even agree. We still agree. So, but to hear the, the conversations, like, for manic depressive, they have these really brilliant questions like, are you happy? Are you sad? <laughs> for schizophrenia, do you see visions? Do you talk to God? Do I talk to you? Well, everybody in Georgia is supposed to be talking to God. <laughs> it's like required, just about. Everybody's Christian. You know, and so there are these interesting conversations like, are you happy or sad? So um, a poor, white, or black man or woman Yes, I'm sad. Why are you sad? Well, my mama died, my daddy died, I have a stroke, and I'm in here. <laughs> and they're very, you could say, well, I would be sad too. Or are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. Why are you happy? Jesus is my master. I mean, pretty predictably, you go to religion, and that if you're happy, that you're happy. There's one of these that I have, I have done an article on and really loved the most. Um, and she, she's going to be where I am, but I can tell you. She's, uh, her symptoms are, Dancing, praying, shouting, and crying. And uh, this is very disturbing. <laughs> I guess it was back home, maybe to the sheriff. Uh, she had some commotion too in the family. Uh, and so they're trying to figure out whether this is right, Christian or schizophrenia or whatever. But you read the medical history and she's had 11 pregnancies and she's lost nine children. And she's got eight brothers and sisters, and she's lost four. So the argument I make is that they have confused the symptoms with her own spiritual processes of healing, which are there's this shot ring that's very typical <coughs> along the coast of Georgia, Peachy and Gold culture. It's come over from Muslim traditions in Western Africa, and it's a kind of wing shot, and it's very kind of hypnotic. And, uh, in 1939, uh, Zoe Hurston, who is being trained, as, has been trained by that time as an anthropologist, uh, does this e examination and makes some films of Beaufort, South Carolina, of women doing these ring shouts. It does this beautiful description of them. But <coughs> this woman, whose name was Charity, didn't have a black anthropologist in 1912 and 11 in the Georgia sanitarium. You know, she just had these psychiatrists, and they were very they were very irritated at her that she remained exalted on the war. And that's her expression, exalted on the war. And that's what I, the first article that I wrote was exalted on the war. But she kept herself exalted on the war all the way through. You don't hear about her anymore. Her physical condition is declining. But I felt like, you know, like that's one of those like human spirit accommodating itself to desolation moments. You know, you're in the mix of an expanding institution, you're in the midst of doctors who have no sympathy or knowledge for you and really don't, who are trying to deal with psychiatric categories that have come to them and they don't understand them anyway, and so they're just trying to fit you in one box and they go into their 
they go into their staff meetings and they have debates and sometimes they don't decide. It's like four to four. And you still just sit there and they hardly ever send anybody home. So, um, so in terms of psychiatric records, then those are some of them. Um, the the ProQuest historical newspapers, which you should have access to, as the, for instance in Georgia, the digitalized Atlanta Journal and Constitution from 1868 when it was founded to 1945 when we got the digital. So it will spit out an amazing amount of stuff. Um, and then Supreme Court cases. I've used the whole chapter as a Supreme Court case on um, the inherent sanity of property. This guy quotes it here. Um, so there's a, there's a set of there's, there's a set of sources like that. There's not like two rooms full of boxes from 1842 to 2010. There was fires, they dumped them out. I mean, these institutions have been kind of abandoned. They don't have people, but you're not going to keep the records. So I've patched together a bunch of sources, including Alice Walk, who's in the next county, and she writes uh, in search of her gardens and talks about sanity and insanity and her grandmother's generation. Uh, Lillian Smith, who's composing segregation, has a little section on one of her characters. Is some mother, some girls, girl, just places up and down. It's really throughout a lot of the writers. So I also keep them as sources and archives, archive material. Um, so, so that's some of the I'm really struck by your first question, um, which is how does the culture that justifies slavery refuse to possibly? Etc. determines who is and who is insane. Yeah. And especially not very well. well. <laughs> and how are they trained? And what right. was the composition yeah. of the Black Health Hospitals, yeah. which I expect is what we see yeah. in mass incarceration today, yeah. Yeah. instead of getting punishing. Yeah. Um, and how we research and what who's right, who who somewhere in your research or people who commented on this um, way in which yeah. Don't read the boys. It's in Atlanta from 1896 to 1901, and then back from 1935 to 1945. So I'm going to work him in as a kind of cultural informant. He's doing like sold by clothes, so that was kind of bifurcated with the conflicts and everything to be African in America. We wrote that from there. He does black like reconstruction in Atlanta maybe a year or two before Robert Mitchell does gone to win. So we're still fighting slavery and construction in those two novels. And the whole lost cause runs through. I mean, in this institution, it really has fascinated me. What does it mean to have, in one increasingly big mental hospital, people who are, have grown up in slavery, people who have grown up as masters, Confederate veterans, Union veterans maybe, including some of the black people who two or three thousand, 100,000 black people who fought in the Union Army. And then you go on, or housewives and professional women, and just this whole set of people of varying ages at any one time, like the slice of it. And they're increasingly getting put in different buildings, but what was it like, really, to be thrown in with this group of people? And one of the things that I've tried to imagine, especially in the earlier years, because one of my very favorite archival pieces is the 1845 report from Dr. David Cooper. And I'm telling you this, I was going to read you, I'm just telling you stuff, and it's probably goes faster than I can answer your questions, but he really wanted to be a great writer. And he looked at the psychiatric profession and the, the great people like Pennell and these people who wrote all these case histories and stuff, and so he wanted to write a brilliant annual report. And so one of the things he did was put in all the information about the first 30 years. He just drenched with information about just all the case histories he read in that thing. He also wrote the longest sentences, kind of pre-fall, <coughs> all these made up words that you could never know. Um, and then he packed it up and he sent it off to the American Journal of Insanity, which had just been formed by the Scott and Myrie at Rickham, who's very different from Cooper, was one of the better doctors of the day. He had gone to Europe for a year and training as the real doctors. The people who got the most training, medical training, would go to Europe because they would be more scientific and they were just giving people purges, laxatives, emetics, which means baking vomit, um, arsenic, opium, cuffs. You know, it wasn't, wasn't fun to be in that setting, but in Europe they were having other kinds of experimenting the brain and trying to figure out ways to 
Okay, so he quickly got him there. He came back. He was appointed to the Utica Asylum, which is the first public asylum in New York State. And he wanted to regularize the profession and bring it up. So he helped to found the American Journal of Insanity and this association of, of the um, superintendents of insane asylums, which were the psychiatrists. So his, so Cooper's report gets up to Brigo, and he completely pans it. He writes to trustees, you should never allow this to happen again. It's, I don't even know if there's an asylum there. It's this strange combination of words and facts, and you really can't, he just said this, I just, as kindly as I can say this, you can never let this happen again. So they fired him. And I felt very sorry for him, because he got a really bad review, and I'm writing psychiatric text, and I don't care. I was like, oh my gosh. But anyway, it's just beside the point. But, but in the meantime, he got all these descriptions. And so you can really get into the soul of the white folks here, because it's only white people in 1867 when African Americans come in through Freedmen's Bureau hospitals, which kind of was a very exciting moment to me as a little bit because I was thinking, okay, now, 67, black people would be coming in here, and it's like all the Freedmen's Bureau, Atlanta Freedmen's Bureau, Savannah Freedmen's Bureau coming here. But, um, and a lot of their symptoms have to do with the times. And, and I can read you a little piece on the name, well, you don't find it now, but Nancy Malone, who's, who's been all over the place, she's a wanderer, she's 50, they say she's an idiot, she just talks all the time, backwards, forwards, sideways, she's telling about invasions and camp meetings and massacres and all this <coughs> history, and it's like she's this griot. <laughs> just going up and down and sideways, telling the history of the culture. So you can imagine that she's been traveling <coughs> to Pike County, which is on which is on the Alabama border, and she's probably seen a lot of this. And she's been in these camp meetings that were very democratic, wild kind of spaces where everybody camped out, probably drinking and praying and hallucinating that the devil was going to throw into a lake of redstone. And you know, so you come out of these spaces. She's been in some of those, and I can just imagine her like on the side of the road, looking up to see a slave buffalo go by, or to see Creek Indians being led out, or, you know, to go back in the woods and travel some of that backwoods and who you, who you find in the backwoods back there and so forth. So, so those people really, because of Cooper, he got fired for being so self-disclosing there. Um, so so those, those were some of the most um, useful um, and interesting kind of histories. After that, the door kind of closes. You don't get a lot of interiors until you get to those um, psychiatric interviews where you really get the voices of people. So that when, when this woman who's dancing and praying and shouting and she's having the real conversation with the real psychiatrist and he says, well, do you uh, hear voices? He says, no. He says, oh, good, you don't hear voices. She says, well, I do hear voices. And she says, he says, of who? Like, well, my brothers and sisters. And he says, they're not living on me. She says, you know, they're not living. She says, well, they're not real. She says, they are not living, but they are real. It's like, you know, <laughs> she slayed it. I mean, she beat it. It's like a metaphysical argument. It's a physiological argument, the nature of reality. Like, I can hear voices from people who are dead. People do it. She says, people do it. They come back. People talk to you. And it's a whole cultural tradition. And I have, you know, I mean, having conversations with the dead. And she just explains this to this guy. And if we had a debating society, she would have won the conversation. But she doesn't. But you do get those voices there that are very real and palpable. This is this is too big a question. Yeah. I'm, just yes. yeah. I'm just thinking about how all of this tracks with control of and judgment about and punishment of women's sexual and reproductive behaviors. Because over this time period that you're talking about, you have slave women being treated as breeders. So they're not being locked up for having children because they want them. The masters want them to have the children. And, and then you have people uh, being judged as feeble minded if they're not married and they're having children, whether they've been raped or forced or whatever. And they are being put in institutions and are being sterilized. And people in the institutions for other reasons are being sterilized because you don't want them to reproduce. 
So they come into the yard and they start engaging in conversation. And then remarkably, everybody sits down or stands up or whatever. And Sue Pagan, supposedly this witness woman, in 10 sentences tells the most remarkable, clear story. I was a nurse in, um, I was a nurse in Macon in a hospital. A doctor there got me pregnant. I had the baby. He took it away. He sent me to Millersville. A year later, I got out. I couldn't find my baby. I came to Atlanta. These women took me in, and they let me stay here for work. They treat me well. I would like to stay. Now that does not sound crazy. That does not sound crazy. But the sheriff is very concerned about Sue's 
safely so he takes her out of the spinning loop. And that's the last we see ever. It's just like 10, ten paragraphs. And yet, the idea, like, why would they be saying she's crazy? Like, why does the headline say, witless white woman? Like, what's going on here? If you had this in front of you, you would have an archival piece that's really a jewel like this. And you're going to try to understand why the headline would say, witless white woman, be so alarmist. What would that be about? It's 1882, it's Atlanta, it's post construction and so forth. What's going on? Okay. Uh, the had uh, nine miscarriages. Uh, did they look at any of the earlier to see if there may have been anything that uh, could have caused that, or did they just only look at how she reacted toward that afterwards? Which one did you picture? I think she said she had uh, she was pregnant at that time. Yeah, yeah. You, we're going back to Cherry Curtis, which is 1911, right? And so you're what are you, you're asking. For that case. Uh, did they check to see if there was anything beforehand that may have led up to those? Yeah, decisions? they have a very thorough history, and that's where you get the information about nine, 11 children, nine of them died, eight brothers and sisters, four of them died. And I went in, I went back into that medical examination and all those field guys to be able to say, oh, well, this myself can conclude from that information, the reason she's doing this kind of dance and singing and praying is because of grief. She just had so much loss. You know, and that's kind of why she's doing it. So it was all there in our time. It's just how you interpret it. And I chose to interpret it away from the doctors and from what I felt like was like an interview on shout dances and stuff like that. It just seemed clear to me there's a total inability to respect the culture she's coming from. You know, to understand it. it was just a kind of apology. What about this question though? Why call a white woman crazy when she flips the black people in Atlanta doing laundry? Well, it's a steal from the title one of the books. She's a race trader and she's living with African Americans, so she must be out of mind to associate with people of African descent. She's a white woman. Right. You gotta you got be crazy to do that. Yeah. And and then out there's a wonderful book that Tara Hunter wrote, who used to teach at UNC and is at the Manager Center now. Um, with me, with us, but uh, it's called To Join My Freedom. It's on African American women post emancipation in the South. And she's got a whole section on laundry women's strikes in the 1880s. Like one of the ways that black women could organize was through um, the people who were taking in laundry, which they really preferred to go to white people's house, bring the laundry away, than have to go into the houses, which were very far situations always with black women. So, I could really think that, wow, these women are part of this laundry women's organization. And <clears throat> they are allied across the community. And Sue is coming and they're letting her work for them. So it's a kind of and it's a, a kind of an amazing piece of solidarity, I think. And I talked to Tara some about this. And she said, you know, I looked for the white women and I couldn't find them. And I said, well, maybe it's because they took them all away. Like, they're really starting to segregate Atlanta. Segregation really emerges gradually to the end of the 19th century, and this is, I thought, it's just, you can't stay with black people. We're going to take you away for your own good, but your family didn't do anything. They let this other thing happen, and actually, a lot of people need that. So, it would seem crazy. You would, want, you would want, you could say somebody was crazy, and then that would make them, you know, we're going to send you to If you, if you wash clothes with black people, you won't send you to the You know, I mean, that was that kind of thing, where it was a warning there, and it was a form of certain control. So that's another example what happened to women who could be at the frame of the doctors and institutions and have babies and so forth. So it's a lot of things. Any questions? Okay. Um, I have a question about the I mean, one of the things, I want to just kind of keep this narrative a little bit because I'm talking about reading, but um, in terms of the dissident tradition, one of the things that happens in 1913 is there's an epidemic of cholera all across the South, which is Turns out to be a nutritional deficiency, but um, they don't know it then. They think it might be something like AIDS. They were just scared of it. So they get this, the public health service, the U.S. public health service, to come in. And there's this Jewish immigre from Austria, uh, Goldenberger. And he decides that it's probably environmental. It's probably got to do with food. And the administrators say, oh, no, 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 no. Everybody eats the same here. 
he goes, oh, okay, well, we just look around. So he goes through the cafeteria line and he notices that the superintendent goes first and the doctor goes second and the nurse goes third and then various patients. And you go in the cafeteria, it's kind of pandemonium. The very, very timid patients are kind of huddled over there and getting the food stolen. So he figures, well, this is about food. And so he does this beautiful experiment, very simple, where he takes a ward of black women and a ward of white women. So he deals with the women. And it's wars in which the women are sicker with pellagra, which had, which was very terrible disease in its stages. And he decides to feed them. So he gives them a decent diet. And he gives the black and the white women the same diet. Which Superintendent Powell, who dies in 19, he would never have done that because any anything to him, if you had to explain it in terms of black health was an issue. Emancipation, and he'll explain how black times and white because he had his whole racial aspect. But Goldenberger says, feed them both, feed them all, and in six months they're well. Cures pellagra in six months by a decent diet, and then they want to prove second time that it really works. And they go to a couple of men's white men's prisons in Mississippi, where the men are eating very well and they're very healthy, and they get them to sign these agreements that they wouldn't uh, wouldn't pass the IRB now that they can deprive them of food in six months. And they do, and they get that freaks them out, they leave. So he's, he's shown that you can cure plague without food. And it's a deficiency, it turns out to be a nice and deficiency. And that you may even just need to feed people better. So in terms of that kind of dissident work, non-racist, just observing things, and standing up for women, and standing up for black and white men, women, equally like this, those kind of things in that past too. So, as we get to the current, I'm going to let y'all go in there, but get to the current crisis in psychiatry and those kind of things, there are dissident traditions and there are oppressive traditions. And it's been that way from the beginning and the get-go. And there's, there's information from the dissidents that can feed us now, including all of these psychiatrists who come out and said, we need to figure this stuff out, out from the ground up. From the ground up, we just need to start again. So, um, for any of us who ever have been afraid of being crazy, or that somebody's going to think us to, I think there's, to me, there's hope in this. And um, we're at a time in the culture where a lot is up in the air. But in terms of how we come together and figure out these questions of sanity and health and so forth, I'm hoping that a study from the <coughs> hospital from 1842 into now will help at least give some information and form those discussions and give some content to some of our fears and some of our hopes as well. So I really appreciate your coming tonight and your great questions, and I'm happy to answer more of them, but I know you all have part of the presentation.